Hello and welcome to this presentation on product configurator functionality in IFS Applications 10. I'm Greg Romanello, a senior business solution architect at IFS working in the Americas. What you'll see in this presentation is IFS Applications 10 at Update 9, just released a few weeks ago, October 2020. When IFS Applications 10 RTM was released, it included the new Arena user experience. That's another topic covered in other presentations in this series of informational webinars. Today's presentation is using the IFS Enterprise Explorer UX, or IEE, so it will be in context for those of you still on a version prior to Apps 10, or for those of you on Apps 10 but not yet using the Arena user experience. For those of you already on Apps 10 in Arena, the functionality you see today and more is available in that user experience. After I explain some terminology, I'll contrast product configuration with sales rules configuration. I'll explain the different types of product configuration and configuration methods. I'll review and explain all the data elements required to be set up to use the product configurator. And I'll do a live demo of the product configurator in Apps 10. Now let's get oriented to the terminology we use for configure to order, specifically the product and sales rules configurators. Your product's main features are called configuration characteristics. These configuration characteristics may be mandatory or optional. These features have different choices or feature options, which we call configuration characteristic values. These configuration characteristic values may have one of three value types. A value type discrete is for those options that are in a predefined list of choices. A value type variable is for those characteristic values that are numeric and where any value within a range of values is valid even though it has not been predefined. A value type free text is for those characteristic values that are usually alphabetic and are not predefined. Every configuration of your product represents a selection of configuration characteristics and configuration characteristic values. Each different combination of these is assigned a unique identifier we call a configuration ID. The configuration ID is assigned during the configuration dialog, where you choose the characteristic values. To be meaningful to the back office, engineering, procurement, and manufacturing, you may define a matrix product structure, also known as a super bill, which we call a configuration product structure, or CBOM. You may also define a super router. This is just an introduction to these terms. I will elaborate on them later. Let's distinguish product configurator from sales rule configurator. The sales rule configurator defines how the part is sold, what features are available to the customer for a product, what options are valid for those chosen features. The product configurator, also known as the back office configurator, defines how the part is made, materials and guidelines defined in structures, operations and work instructions defined in routings. Each customer ordered part is usually a unique combination of options. The sales configurator is a guide that helps the salesperson or the customer when using the IFS business to business or B2B customer portal during the product configuration process. The user is prompted to provide selections for features, the product attributes they desire, again known as configuration characteristics, and the options, the choices available for a characteristic known as characteristic values. Attributes and attribute values can be attached or removed automatically to ensure that a correct product configuration is created for the customer. For example, when you pick a certain model car, in this case, you automatically select the large GPS screen and the 10-speed transmission. 
During user selection, all characteristics and their values are evaluated to ensure they are compatible with each other. The product configurator defines the manufacturing rules governing the structure and routing elements to be used in one or more manufacturing orders for an instance of a configured product. The evaluation of the rules attached to manufacturing structures, guidelines, routing operations, and work instructions yields valid configuration-based product specifications for the parent part and all subordinate configured parts. While sales rule configuration differs from back office or manufacturing configuration, both attach to the same configured part. Let me distinguish different configuration types and methods. Some products can be configured at a single level where all choices made can be fulfilled by manufacturing or more likely assembling all the components on a single shop order. Other more complex products that are defined as multiple level structures requiring intermediate shop orders and purchase orders are considered multi-level configurations and are handled as a network of shop orders and purchase orders. Officially known as dynamic order pegging, I redefine DOP as direct order pegging because the network of orders needed to fulfill the customer order line is automatically and directly pegged to the customer order line. You can perform product configuration in three different fashions. First, for a non-sales part, such as when developing features and options for a product, you can use an interim demand header for a product with multi-level structure or use a shop order type prototype for a product with a single level structure. This is a great way to identify features and their options and try out the configuration dialog without having to set up a sales part. Second, for a sales part, you can create the configuration from a sales quotation or from a customer order or even from a CRM business opportunity. Third, for developing a new product or an incompletely configured product not yet ready with all the bill of material, routing, and even part number information in the master tables, you can use product estimate bid management. This means there is tremendous flexibility in deploying the product configurator at your organization. Let's take a tour of what's necessary for the IFS configurators to work. And a note on the configured items you'll see, not to be confusing, but to illustrate the variety of products you've seen an automobile, you'll be seeing a bike, in the live demo you'll see some other products as well. For configured products, you will need to identify their attributes by defining characteristics, or the features of the product, the characteristic values, the suitable option choices for those product features, and the product configuration family. Features and options, or characteristics and characteristic values, can be used by more than one product family. Think exterior colors for trucks and cars. They are different product families, but exterior color is a common attribute. Many products may change the offering of features and options over time. To do this in IFS, you define part configuration revisions. Let's look closer at the basic data. Here, a bike has two features, wheel diameter and frame color. For the characteristics representing the features of the parts, you define the possible choices or configuration characteristic values. For a bike, we could define characteristic values 26 and 28 for wheel diameter, and red, white, or blue for frame color. The characteristic value type for wheel diameter happens to be discrete. There are only two predefined values. The characteristic value type for frame color is discrete as well. There are three predefined values. You also need to define a configuration family representing the group of products. 
In this case, the characteristics and their possible values are for the product group of bikes. Eventually, you define the part or model that belongs to the product family. Similar parts are usually associated with the same family. In the part configuration revision, you identify for this part the valid configuration characteristics and characteristic values. If that setup of configuration characteristics and values is modified, then the change set is phased in as a new revision, and the old set is phased out. As in this revision, identified as part configuration revision number two. Note, blue is no longer available as a frame color, and a new wheel diameter, 24, has been added. Every configuration of your product represents a selection of configuration characteristics and configuration characteristic values. Each different combination of these is assigned a unique identifier we call a configuration ID. This is different than the part configuration revision. The part configuration revisions represent the characteristics and the values that are possible at a specific point in time or for a time frame. The configuration ID represents the specific choices made for a characteristic value and will be unique to that selection. The configuration ID is assigned after performing the configuration dialog where you choose characteristic values for the configuration characteristics. Now let's take a look at how this works. For single level and multi-level configured products, you need to define a configuration structure instead of a product structure, although in the configuration structure, you can have sub-assemblies that are standard product and have a product structure. The configuration structure required to support the procurement and manufacture of the bike would look something like this. Each of the characteristic values are represented in the configuration product structure. The routing required to support the assembly of the bike would look something like this. Each of the characteristic values are represented in the routing. One of the capabilities offered in the product configurator is to adjust certain fields. In this case, note that instead of the operation numbered as 10, regardless of the wheel diameter, the operation number in this case reflects the wheel diameter. So a quick review before moving on. For configured to order products regularly offered in a catalog, you would create a master part and an inventory part. The master part and inventory part are the same and usually only one part number is created to represent the product family. After all, one of the major reasons to deploy a product configurator is to reduce or eliminate the proliferation of part numbers and product structures and routing data. With proper product structures, routings, and rules, a single part, a single configuration structure, and a single routing can correctly represent how to make or assemble multiple variations on a theme. It is possible to select the appropriate materials from a configuration structure based on product configuration rules. It's also possible to define rules to select the related component material work guidelines. To simplify administration and make it easier to test and implement, it's also possible to establish rules to select a configuration structure alternate instead of using row by row rules in the default configuration structure to generate the appropriate list of materials and their guidelines. Likewise, for routings, it is possible to select the appropriate operations and their related work guidelines using rules. You may also establish a rule to select a routing alternate instead of using row-by-row -row rules in the default routing to generate the appropriate set of operations, tooling, and work guidelines. It's time to see live software. We'll look at IFS Applications 10 now. First, I'll take you on a tour of required data. This includes characteristics and characteristic values for those characteristics, configuration family, part configuration revision, and CTO manufacturing standards, configuration structure, routing, and configuration rules within each. 
Second, I'll show you some optional data you can set up that might be helpful. This would be configuration formula and configuration table. Third, I'll perform some product configurations. I'll do a configuration for a non-sales part in a shop order or in an interim demand header. I'll do a configuration for a sales part in a sales quotation or a custom order. Then I'll do a configuration for an incompletely configured product and make refinements outside of the product configurator. I'll do this in the product estimate management module because this approach eliminates the need to create a revision for what might be a one-off quotation to a customer. Then if you win the quotation, without having to revise a configuration specification, you can have IFS product estimate management create a discrete part, a discrete structure, and a discrete routing. This is all handled from the estimate. By the way, there's another webinar focusing on the functionality we provide to you through product estimate management. Let's start by taking a look at characteristics. So here are some characteristics for a, a ball valve, and we'll see how we use these characteristics in an interim demand header later on. If we take a look at the gear shift, gear shaft, I should say, We'll see this configuration of shop order, and if we go into the configuration characteristic, we can see that there's three choices available. And if we take a look at the toolbox, we can see that we have a number of characteristics to select from here. If we bring all these up in the configuration characteristic, Notice here in TB color, we can take advantage of media. So if I click on attachments down here and I click on blue, we can see that we have a media item showing here's the shade of blue that we're talking about, sky blue. We click here on green, it will show us our vivid green, and then we have another media item here for dark metallic red. Now you can use this for any option. So if we go back to the list of configuration characteristics, you could see that besides color, we could also have uh, perhaps locking options would have some media items uh, as well as the wheel options. Let's go back, take another look at one last set of characteristics and we have garage door characteristics. And there are uh, quite a few here We'll see how all of these garage door characteristics work when we go through a sales quotation and a customer order. Notice, however, for a characteristic here up on top, uh, the customized color one, it's an alpha with a discrete option. Down here, we have a characteristic string. It's alpha with a variable value. We also have a numeric with a variable value and a numeric with a discrete option. So it, uh, they can mix and match uh, as necessary. So I've grouped these characteristics because they belong together, but where you really identify which group of characteristics belongs to a particular part is in the configuration family. So let's take a look at a configuration family. We have four of them here. If we take a look at the toolbox, again, we just looked at these characteristics, but notice now these are assigned, these five characteristic IDs and their um, option values. Here we have number of drawers is discrete, one, two, or three. Here we have our lock. We have an auto or a manual and our wheels, uh, yes or no as an option. They're connected to this toolbox. If we take a look at the usage, the toolbox comes in uh, a number of different variations. So we have four different parts. Now, you don't have to have this many parts. You usually can get away with one part, depending on how you do your uh, characteristics and the family. So having said that, let's go back and take a look at gear shaft. If we go here to the configuration family, we see it's a very simple configuration. We only have one feature. It has three option choices, a four inch gear shaft, a six inch gear shaft, or an eight inch gear shaft. And its usage is simply to just a single part. 
However, if we go back and take a look at this uh, ball valve, we take a look at configuration family, its usage is, again, just to a single part. Now, in addition to the usage tab and the characteristics, if we go back here, take a look at EasyFlex, look at the configuration family. So again, we have all our characteristics and again, these are slidable so I can, or scrollable so I can see all of my characteristics. And again, as I look at a particular characteristic, then I would see the option values for them. So here I go to customize color. Here I go to garage door, standard color, and so on. Notice for this EasyFlex garage door product line, there are many, many, many characteristics, and some of them have a few options some of them have s several more options so we have uh, a number of of things to keep track of sometimes it's better to put our attributes in categories so notice when you get more complex it might make it easier to set up your configuration dialog for the end user to display attributes by a category so for our garage door here we have some uh, general information we have dimensions information we have some base information security and so on so that is user defined uh, so you can do the grouping uh, as best fit to the user and again we have uh, these parts that are all connected to the set of characteristics because they belong to the EasyFlex configuration family. So all of these part numbers when you go through the dialog would use the set of characteristics or a subset of characteristics depending on what's appropriate. The place we define what is in place for a particular configuration family in terms of characteristics and characteristic values is the part configuration revision. So let's take a look at the gear shaft again. And what we see here when we take a look at the part configuration revision is that it's at revision number one. It was phased in September 28, 2001. It has not been phased out, so it is still a, the released revision. This is what we would use whenever we are configuring something uh, for this part 250-G20C. So we have our characteristic ID and we have these three options. Now, over the course of time, if we decided we wanted to add additional dimensions to this gear shaft, we would rev this up probably to rev number two, would have a new phase in date, and it would present either new characteristics or for this characteristic length, new option value IDs. Let's go back and take a look at the garage door. When we look at its part configuration revision, notice here that we have, uh, for instance, for height, we have a characteristic, but it's a variable value. So there are no predetermined or discrete option value ID. Same thing with width. However, once we get to the finish or the type of handle or the type of lock, because these are discrete type options, they will present the list of values that you may select from when you're picking an option for this feature. Notice there is also a column default characteristic value. These are all blank. So this really is a blank slate uh, presented to the user when you do your configuration. And we'll see what this looks like, so to speak, as a blank slate when we go into a sales quotation and customer order. Now, in comparison, where we have no values for default characteristic value, if we go back and take a look at our ball valve, and we look at the part configuration revision for this. It's at Rev1. It was phased in September 30, 2020. Here we see that every characteristic, whether it is alpha or numeric or discrete, uh, has a value for its default characteristic. Let's take a look at another one, the toolbox, and we will look at its part configuration revision. It has default characteristic value even for those characteristics that have no set of discrete options so even though it's a variable value the default value is five once we have our characteristics and characteristic values and part configuration revisions set up and attached to items 
we would need to identify which choices require which components and which operations in a shop order. So to do that, let's take a look at our configuration structure. Let's start with the gear shaft. And notice we open up a window. It is a product structure, but it's a special version of a product structure window called configuration structure. And that is because we have a couple of choices here at the alternate level to apply rules for selecting this alternate for this part at this site. We also have at every row of components a column here, rules exist to select a component or perform an action on a component, uh, component by component within that configuration structure. Notice this is a single level structure. We don't see the next level option available when we do a right click. However, let's compare that to our ball valve. So let's take a look at configuration structure ball valve and notice here, we don't even have any components. And this illustrates the flexibility that product configurator offers. You can define all of your features and options without having to have bill of material and bill of labor in place. That is, after you have your features and options figured out and you have them configured the way you would like them presented to the user, then you can come back later and build your structure and routing. Let's take a look at another configuration structure, this one for the garage door. And what we'll see here is that we have rules existing for several our components here, item 53, item 54, and item 12. If we were to take a look here at um, our item 53, we can see that we have some rules. And we do a right click and we see what our configuration instruction rules are. And essentially we are including this part number 53 whenever our characteristic value for garage door emergency stop is set to basic or the user chooses childproof. Let's go back and we'll take a look at 54 here. And in this case, our configuration structure rule indicates that we get this childproof stop kit 54, part 54 is included whenever that emergency stop is set to childproof. So user has a couple options here how you're going to include components. Another example here is for component 12. Notice here that we do have rules. So if we take a look at configuration structure rules, we have actions for this. We'll come back to this in a moment. Let's go back to this level. Notice rules exist to select this, but I can also embed rules at subordinate levels. So we can go to the next level here, and we'll just pick our revision number one, and then notice at the subordinate levels, we can have yet more rules that determine how components are chosen at sub-assembly levels through many levels in a configuration structure. All right, let's go back to those rules. For this component, line item number eight, we'll go back to the configuration structure rules. And this time, instead of looking at conditions, we'll look at the actions tab and notice here that we are declaring some values for some characteristics. Let's bring up the formulas tab so you can see that for garage door segment density, we'll go to that formula to see that you can create equations or formulas and test the formula. So in this case, segment material density, we need to calculate this for weight. We can enter values, click the test button, and it gives us a result of 3.3. If we go back to our other action declare statement and we take a look at power, if we uh, set our context to the power and go to configuration formula, Notice, because we just ran the test formula, our segment density is 3.3. Now we can test 
what kind of power requirements we have when our height is 3,500 millimeters and our width is 4,500 millimeters and our segment from a previous formula is 3.3. .3. We click the test formula button. We see we have 207.9. Now, in context of what this does for the garage door, that's a longer explanation. But the important part here is that you can develop formulas. You can reference them in your structure rules. Uh, you can also reference them in the routing rules. Now, before we move on to routings, let's take a look uh, at another way to view the image of the configuration structure. Let's go to Config Structure Graphic Items. And we have our garage door system. If we go to component eight, notice here we have our actions. So as you walk through the bill of material, the structure graphic gives you the ability to see the conditions and the actions that are connected to that component. Then, of course, if we expand this and we take a look at uh, our base engine here, for instance, 100 watt, 200 watt, or 300 watt, these are the conditions and that GD power uh, characteristic less than 100 selects the 100 watt engine versus greater than 100, less than 200 for the uh, part number 160. And part number 161 is when GD power requirements are greater than 200. So just another way to look not only at the uh, multi-level indented structure, but also conditions and actions and any formulas they may refer to. So if we go back to this garage door engine, we see our actions, we see the um, segment density. We can also click on formulas and from here, we can also browse to that configuration formula. So nice compact, well not compact, but a nice window that you can do multiple functions uh, from one window. In addition to formulas, we have a feature called configuration combination table. And essentially this acts as a lookup table uh, based on one or more values. You could think of it for those of you that studied math as an F of X, or depending on how many variable, variables you have, an F of X, Y or F of X, Y, Z. So let's get out of math again and come back to uh, IFS applications. An example here of a single variable is I have a combination factor. These are the characteristics that I'm going to use. And for this telecom tower, we have ground condition is my single factor. So if I need to do some kind of calculation or look up something from a table, the configuration combination table in IFS product configurator is the way to do it. So here we have four sequences, four rows. And if it turns out that our ground condition is SND, then for whatever intents and purpose, our return value for some other formula is 0 0.75. If it turns out that our ground condition is CLY clay, 1.25. If it's rock, RCK, it's 2.5. And RCL, it's 1. Now, another example is multiple um, parameters. So in this case, we have combination factors. Uh, back in our toolbox, we have compartments and drawers. And if we take a look at the combination values, we'll see we have five sequences here. The first sequence we'll test is the compartments less than or equal to two and drawers less than or equal to two. If that's true, then we return a value of 16. If not, then we move on to the next sequence in terms of uh, sequence 20. Are the compartments equal to three and the drawers equal to two? If so, then we return a value of 35. If it's three, four compartments and drawers, we return 54 and so on. Now, in terms of testing this, if we go here to our combination factors, we can see we have a test value of two and two. So if we take a look at our values, it should be that we get a return value of 16. If we come back here to our combination factors and we do test table, then it indicates we have a match on combination sequence 10 and the value 16 is returned and that is correct. Sequence 10 returns 16. If we come back here and we make this uh, 4, and then we test again, 
We're going to get a match on combination sequence 40, value 72, and that is correct, 40, 72. So a neat way to essentially implement an f of x functionality or f of x, y, x, y, z, x, f of a, b, c, d. You can have as many combination factors here as you wish. This table has two. The previous table only has a single lookup, but again, you can use uh, as many as required. Let's go back to my other table, the toolbox table, and notice just in case, for whatever reason, the combination values don't yield a return value by going through these five sequences, I have a default return value established here. So I start with a value of one as my return value by default. I'll go through the sequences. If I find uh, a, re a proper return value based on these conditions, then that replaces the default value. If not, then the value returned to the configurator is, a, is the default return value, in this case, one. All right, let's create some configurations. This first one, using an interim demand header, is because I have no sales part, I have no configuration structure, and I have no routing for this item. It's at, it's uh, my Fisher ball valve, and our required date is uh, out here on the fourth. So I click save here. And now I can do a right click, go to configuration uh, dialog, and I'll create. Now notice all of the characteristic values showed up because I have a default. I'm just going to accept these. So I click save. And then I can go back to my interim demand header. And notice I have no component or no operation. But this is a method that I can run through the dialog to see how it works. Now, let's create another one. This time it will be for uh, a part that does exist. We're going to go to site three here. We're going to use the gear shaft. And this is part 250-G20C. And notice it says it is also configurable. And we'll put a need date out here, the fourth. We'll hit save. Again, nothing for component, nothing for operation. So we'll hit the configuration. We'll create a configuration. And then also we just have that one characteristic. We go to our characteristic value. We can use a list of values. And we see 4, 6, and 8. So I'll pick 8 for the gear shaft. I'll hit save. And a couple things. My configuration status has gone to completed. It is possible while you're working on things to leave the window and the configuration status would be set at incomplete. You may come back, you finish up answering all the questions, then it would go to status completed as it has here. Also, do you want to reevaluate the interim demand header? That means it's going to determine what you would need for components and for operations. So I'll say yes. And we'll do all of this. Click OK, and we'll just wait for this to refresh. Notice here I have operation 12 cut for 8-inch final shaft length, and I have a component. It's 250G300. Now, if we go back to our configuration, we can edit this. We're going to change our value to 4. When we save this, we'll ask, do you want to reevaluate the interim demand header? We say yes. Again, we'll let it evaluate the configuration through the rules. Click OK. And then same component. But now notice the operation number has changed from 12 to 10. And the operation description cut for 4-inch final shaft length. So that is all coming out of the routing. Now, I don't have to use the interim demand header. I would only use this if I have no sales part and no configuration bomb, no configuration routing, so to speak. So let's go take a look at how we would do this in a shop order. So I have a shop order 200,445. It's for the same part 250G20C. And we take a look at the materials. 
take a look at operations. Let's say that we uh, want to change our configuration here. So we edit. And this time we're going to make it six inches. So we hit save. It will ask, do we want to update materials and operations? We say yes. And as soon as it finishes its processing, it marks it completed. We can go back to our shop order. And then notice our operations tab here shows operation number 11. We saw 10 when it was the 4 inch. We saw 12 when it was cut for 8 inch. Now we see operation number 11 for the 6 inch final shaft length. So you can configure not only the description but also the operation sequence uh, to make that more meaningful if that's useful to you. All right, let's create a sales quotation for a configured part that does have a sales part. So I've created a header. We have customer NA1000. Their need date is December 4. And we have quotation lines. So here's our sales part number, EasyFlex 10 for the garage door, the EasyFlex garage door system. We have a sales quantity of one. And it indicates uh, in the configurable column that this indeed is a configurable item. Configuration ID asterisk indicates we have not run the configuration dialog, so we have not identified this as a unique configuration. And the configuration status is blank. Again, we have not done the configuration. So if we are ready to do the configuration, we'll create it now. It'll take us through the dialog. Notice we've attached media items here. So as we walk through this, we may uh, experience different media items popping up in the upper right-hand corner. So if we take a look at our garage door here, uh, we have a height of 24.38. Uh, we have a width of 48.76. And again, those are variables, so we don't have a lookup. But when I come here to country of installation, I can do a lookup, and it will show me I have three choices here, Europe, North America, UK. Uh, for an icon view, of course, you can depict uh, with different images, uh, and we'll pick North America. So I click OK here. Finish or material of door. Again, I can do a lookup. And in this case, I'll go back to list and I'll take a steel finish uh, type of handle. Now, I don't always have to use the list of values. If I know what kind of handle I want, in this case, I want a standard, all I have to do is start typing in, use control K, and I can get my uh, value entered. The power system is 115. My type of, type of lock is an abloy lock. And the color of my garage door is going to be, if we do the look up here, white. So I'll save this. Notice up here, configuration status is incomplete. Uh, configuration ID has been assigned to 01064. And that represents this combination of characteristic values for these chosen characteristics. So hit save. We'll let it go through its work. It's going to validate. Marks it completed. Now I can go back to the sales quotation. And again, here I can see the configuration ID 201064. Status is completed. Uh, I'm all set to go. If you're using sales quotation, then the next step could be to convert this quotation line. Of course, if you're not using quotations, then we could just go right to a customer order. Uh, in this case, we will convert it to customer order. So a configurator passes the information from the sales quotation to the customer order. Customer order P10947 has been created. We want to view it. Our customer order P10947 window shows up. We have our sales part here, the EasyFlex 10. We can add our configuration information. We have a column chooser. So we'll look for config. We have these three items. We'll add them over here. We'll bring these up to the top. So we see our order line item is configurable. Configuration ID is 201064. Configuration status is completed. And now we can take a look at it by going to configuration. 
and we can either view it or edit it. We can replace some characteristic values. New feature in Apps 10, we can replace our configuration with the standard sales part. So if we take a look at view, we'll see here all the characteristic values that we had entered in the sales quotation. All right, let's go back. And this time when we go to configuration, we're going to edit it. And the customer has decided they do not want the white garage door, but they'd rather have a gray garage door. So we click OK. Hit save. And then notice it is completed, but the configuration ID has changed to 201065. We revert back to the customer order line, and it shows it's 201065. So the sales quotation and the customer order offer ability to do a configuration. However, if you start in the sales quotation, all of that information travels forward into the customer order for you. Setting up the configurator, especially if you have a fairly complex product, can take a lot of time. So when you have an opportunity to quote a prospective customer or quote a new opportunity for an existing customer, a variation on a configuration, but you haven't set up all the rules, you may want to consider using product estimate management. Uh, it, so it, it, it offers an opportunity for you to run a configuration. And I'm just going to say I have a config that's incomplete uh, for the garage door. And we're going to run through the configuration, but the customer is asking for something different. And we don't want to have to revise the product structure, or I should say the configuration structure and the routing, the uh, configuration um, revision uh, for the part and so on. Uh, because this very well may be just a single quotation. It may never become an order. And if it becomes an order, it may only be a one-time deal. So the way we would go about this, we're going to use product estimate management here. So I'll create a brand new estimate. So, uh, And by the way, there is another informational webinar uh, that takes you from start to finish on what's required to use an estimate uh, and it goes into much more detail about how it works but i just wanted to expose you to how you might be able to use this for finishing so to speak incomplete configuration setup for brand new opportunities so we have a product an item uh, that is a product here as opposed to uh, a generic placeholder and again that's described in another informational webinar on product estimate management but I'm going to use our part number 10 and that's our garage door system easy flex model and I just need a quantity of one and I save this now the scenario here is that we're going to configure this so if I come over here to configuration I'll create the configuration and we're going to use numbers similar to what we've done in the past so the height of the garage door is going to be 2438 the height is 4876. And as we come down here, we know it's North America. The, the finish on the door is steel. The type of handle is standard. Desired voltage system is 115. The type of lock is abloy. And we have only these choices for the garage door, black, gray, white. So we'll pick an option. And by the way, one of the things you ought to consider when you're doing your characteristics is to have an option value ID other. Other could become green or blue or red, whatever the case may be, and where you would do a substitution. So we'll just click OK. So this is going to start out as uh, a white garage door. But then we're going to make changes to this. So configurator is working through the rules. We see that it's completed. We come back here, and if we take a look, we see our components. And we also see our operations. Now, at any point in time, we could add additional operations. We could add components to this. Before we do that, though, let's take a look at its part number 10. We have our garage door system. It shows that it is a manufactured part. It's an existing part. And it has this configuration, 201064. Now that we have components and operations, we're going to calculate the total cost. So watch this number up here. It'll change from zero. Now it's at 368.75. So what we want to do is on our item 10 here, we have our garage door. And we see that we have white paint because that was a selection. So what we're going to do 
is remove this part, uh, but first let's add its replacement part. So down here in the list of components, I have part number, I'm just going to call it 152GRN. And that's going to be green paint. And it's going to be purchased raw. It'll still be in liters or gallons, as the case may be. And just like the white paint, we're going to need 3.4132 as a quantity per. But because we're going to scrap the rest of it, we're not going to save it. We're going to use this up. And we're going to take the whole uh, four liters. So we have to add, a, a I'm going to add a component scrap factor here, 0 0.8306. And then that should make this required quantity go to four. Uh, actually, a little more than four. So direct material cost, instead of 309, it's going to be five per liter. And if we, we'll see, here's our direct material, 2122 as opposed to 1058 for the white paint. I'll hit save. And now what we need to do is, if we come down here to that same uh, item, we'll see, or the same list of components, we see we have a new item. Uh, it's color conditioned here to show new items. 152 GRN, that's green paint. And now we want to remove the white paint, so we'll just hit the trash can here. That removes that. And now let's do another cost calculation. So we've added a, we, we've changed out a component to satisfy the customer. We're going to recalculate so we give them a cost and a price, or actually a price. And then notice now it went to 379.38. So that's, you know, as, as quickly as I did that, you can have an answer as to what is this going to take to satisfy the customer, you know, to, 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 to win this quotation. Well, we do a little bit of uh, switching here on components, a little bit on operations. Then notice also on this part number 11 in the product tab, we see here's that garage door. We're not going to paint it white. We're going to paint it green. We'll show here's the origin part, and it came from 201068 as a configuration, but notice the structure has changed. So that's the indication uh, at the higher product level as well as at the component level here with conditioning that you have changes to where you started with your configuration, but you have not had to go to the part configuration revision. You've not gone to the product structure. You've managed all that right here in the estimate as, uh, to, as a way to handle a one-off configuration for an important opportunity. Let's review what you just saw. Showed you the required and optional data that product configurator uses and the various ways of performing a configuration. So let me summarize in more detail what we've covered. After explaining some terms, I distinguish the product configurator from the sales rule configurator, which is another session in this 2020 informational webinar series. Then I explain the different types of product configuration and configuration methods, as well as the data elements required to be set up to use the product configurator. And finally, I demonstrated product configurator live in IFS applications 10. I hope this presentation has been beneficial to you. Thank you for listening and let us know if we can help you learn more about additional ways in which IFS applications and our services can deliver more benefits and value to you and your company.